So the next thing we're going to do is to configure the kernel. Now there's <clears throat> been a big improvement. Um, something new has happened with Gen 2 in the last um, month or so, couple of months. Um, they've now got uh, an option where you can build the kernel as if it was an ordinary package and you just emerge the right kernel package and um, it compile it creates the uh, like a default settings for you it compiles it it creates a any rd image um, it copies all the files to the right places it creates all the modules it updates grub and you don't have to do anything else it's uh, quite good if you always struggle with um, building kernels um, now I've had a go at this once and it's quite good but because it builds a lot in the um, uh, out the kernel, you know, like uh, you know, probably all the hardware and a lot more besides. It takes a very long time to build, and on older hardware such as this, it takes hours to build. Um, so what I've done is I've created, well, I've, I've copied a, an old profile I had for this machine and updated it, and I'll be using that. But if you do want to use the pre-built kernel. And you're prepared to wait or in a faster machine um, this bit here about using distribution kernels is what you want to use um, all you need to do is to um, yeah you just run these commands here to make sure you're using the correct um, uh, install type so for example if I was to run this because I'm using grub I'd be running that command to verify I've got the right uh, boot layout, you know, the um, uh, install package is correctly set up. And then I can either run that, which will compile everything for me, or I can run this one, which is a pre-built binary. And that's all there is to it, just, just that one command, basically, to build a kernel. Um, and it's, it works quite well. Like I say, the only, the only caveat was on a slow machine, it's got a lot of work to do, it will take a long time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I do to build a kernel manually, in case you want to have a go at that. And the first thing we need to do is we need to get the sources. So I'm going to run this command here to get the kernel sources, the Gen 2 kernel sources. Um, I'll put minus V on that so we get the verbose listing. And you'll see that um, the package we're requesting to be installed has been highlighted in green. Um, and that shows that it's going to be added to the world set when it's complete. The ones in the darker green have only been brought into the system as dependencies of another package, in, in this case Gen2 sources. Um, so that means that if for any reason these libraries were not required by anything else, then when we cleaned up after we'd done our updates, these files would be removed because they have no dependency requirements by any other package. So it's important not to add things to the world willy-nilly. Um, only add packages you definitely want, you specifically want to be added. And just let Gen2 take care of um, managing all the dependencies and whether or not they need to be um, installed in the system or not. So this is going to take a little while to download. So we'll just wait for that. It says here you can watch the download progress in another terminal. So we could, for example, go to the actual terminal paste oh no we can't paste that in can we of course not let's copy it so oh it's done it already that's quicker than I thought it would be so we won't watch it download because it's already downloaded Oh, I know what it is. It's the other three dependencies that are downloading. They're obviously smaller. So while it's compiling this, it will be downloading all the other packages in the background. So I'm hoping by the time it gets to um, compile the kernel, uh, yeah, to, to install the kernel, 
um, it would have downloaded by that time.
Okay, so that's finished installing the sources for the kernel. We now need to actually build and compile and install the, com the kernel. So, like it says, um, the kernel gets installed into a particular location, then the symlink points at the kernel. So this allows us to have several versions of the kernel and then the currently active one that you want to compile just points at the that, that particular version. And you can view this as well. There's uh, an e-select for the kernel. You can see it manages the sim link automatically for us on that line there. So if we do e-select kernel list it shows us we've only got one installed obviously so that's the default one that's that the sim link is pointing to now within this uh, way of installing the kernel there's again more options you can build it manually and they've got a tool called gen kernel which does a lot of the hard work for you but as I say, I'll be going through the manual just to show you what the steps are um, yeah it says here it it can be seen as the most difficult procedure. Well, yes, it, it is if you've never done it before, but once you've done it a few times, you get to know what to do and what to look out for. And like it says here, the, the hardest part is getting the hardware configured correctly. Um, I'd just like to reiterate why I do this manually. Um, it's not about the kudos of creating a, a kernel. It's more about to do with the time it takes to build the kernel and the amount of space it takes up. I said before when I um, built the kernel um, using the new automatic package method it took several hours I can't remember exactly how many hours four five six hours or something um, the kernel was about seven and a half megabytes there was an uh, initial RAM image as well which was I can't remember how big that was that was several megabytes as well it's probably over 10 megabytes now it's not a lot but when you consider we've only got 128 meg boot partition and it's always handy to have older kernels kicking around in case you need to boot them or refer to them for reference for you know to see something maybe something's not working in a newer version you want to see how it's configured previously um, you soon run out of disk space with this kernel we'll see that it will compile in about half an hour 35 minutes um, and it will only take up about two two and a half megabytes so it's a lot more efficient um, in terms of time and the space it takes up um, another thing with building kernel I try as much as possible to build everything in to the kernel uh, and use modules um, as little as possible and in fact for this machine because it's quite an old machine and quite basic um, you'll see that there are no modules at all um, I just like the idea of having one file with the kernel in it which I can copy around machines if I need to. It's just quite useful. So to that end, what I need to do first of all is to go to where the sources are. User source Linux. Now it doesn't say it here but from my experience with Linux from scratch, um, the developers I say to clean the directory by running this command. Um, Gen 2 has never said that, but I suppose just out of habit, I always run this command. You do have to be careful that you don't run that command when you've got a valid configuration file because it will just wipe everything in here that's not part of the sources. Now, the next thing I'll do um, is, as I say, I've already got a a config file that I've created previously for this machine so I'm going to copy that in now so I've copied it to a floppy on the machine so I'm just going to mount that floppy okay yeah I can mount it directly to the mount here So you can see there's the config file there and there's two other things which I'll show you in a moment that is good to have. In fact, I'll just skip over that bit. Um, it's to get a list of currently running modules and the hardware 
and that's what I've put into these text files so it's a good way of looking to see what the live environment has found the, the uh, Gen 2 minimal install CD and when you build up your kernel and boot into it it's good to cross reference to see if there's anything you've forgotten about or missing or if something's not working as expected to see if you've compiled in the correct um, driver or correct module into the kernel which is what I had a problem with initially with this machine I put this um, uh, additional card into a, a SATA card because the machine's only got IDE drives parallel ATA um, and it's a silicon image card and I was using the wrong drivers basically um, there was two sets of drivers for silicon image cards and they were in two different places and I was using the wrong one um, so I found out that it had a different name in the kernel, the driver for it, and that's how I found out to how to select the correct one. So what I need to do first of all is to um, get this uh, config file extracted and put it into a file called .config, and this is a hidden file that the kernel program uses. So that should be here now. So if I list, you see, you can't see it there because it begins with a dot. It's a hidden file, but I can view it. And there it is. So now that's in there, I can do make old config just to make sure that that config file is brought up to the same level um, as the current running kernel. It should be because I think it's the same version, so it shouldn't have anything to do. If there was any changes, it would ask me some questions. No, there's no changes. And then I just do make menu config, and that gets the main menu for uh, like a sort of interface to configure the kernel, a text interface. And there it is. And you can see if I go to general setup, see I've got things like this. I've added um, a suffix to the kernel version number, so that will appear in the um, kernel file that uh, gets produced when we compile it. Um, but I can show you the steps we need to do. Normally, you just go straight into make menu config. It will create a set of defaults, and then you'd have to go through each menu option and fine-tune the kernel. So as I say, the first thing we need is this PCI utils. This is useful to see what hardware is connected to the PCI bus and because just about everything is connected to the PCI bus. It should show you all the important hardware that you need to make sure is built into the kernel. So again, you can see PCI utils is the package we're requesting to install and it will be emerged as part of the world set so it's in bright green and it's got a dependency that's not going to be merged into the world set but because it's dependency it will exist in the system and that's in just normal um, sort of mid shade green so let's get that installed those two packages
Okay, so that's finished. So now I've got this LSPCI command, and it's best to run it with a minus K option to show the kernel modules, and I'll pump it through less as well. And you can see that it's showing us um, all the the physical hardware device connections and what each device is. So you can see it's an AMD 760 multiprocessor. Um, not sure what that is. Um, so there's the PCI bridge, the ISA bridge as an IDE interface. Um, and then you can see for the ID interface, it's got a kernel driver, Pat, Pata, underscore AMD. So these are the things that are important. Also got a, an SM bus called AMD 756 SM bus. You can search for these in the kernel and activate them. A VGA card, it tells you there what it is and a little bit more about it. So I've just enabled the Nouveau drivers in the kernel because it's an older video card. I'd normally use the actual proprietary NVIDIA drivers, but um, it may be supported still with a, a very old version. But I thought because it's an old version, it hasn't got the features of a modern card, perhaps not anyway. Uh, I'd give the Nouveau driver a spin. Um, you can see there's a built-in USB driver so it's the OHCI driver on the PCI bus um, it's identified this silicon image card that I had trouble with because um, it was probably because it's a PCI card rather than a or PCI X card rather than just an ordinary ISA or maybe PCI card but yeah it was it's this driver here that I found was in a different location then I've got my twin network card with a box standard Intel E1000 driver, a sound card, uh, which also got joysticks that gets pulled in as part of that kernel driver, and just scroll down to the bottom a bit more. Um, I've got a separate USB 2 card in there, so it's in the HCI driver on the PCI bus, and I also got a Firewire controller, and lastly the built-in network. Um, adapter which is the 100 megabit one which I've I'm not using like so I'm using the gigabit one not bad it's so as long as I go into the kernel with make menu config like I say keep a note of them go in there and just check that all those hardware options are installed um, at the first boot up there shouldn't have, shouldn't be any problems um, it does suggest that there's certain things that need to be activated either for the Gen 2 system or just sanity things that make sh to make sure things work. So I'll just go through and check these. So it makes sh it says make sure that you enable Dev Temp FS support. So you can see it's in device drivers at the top level. So we go down to device drivers and press enter. Then generic driver options. So we look for that. There it is there and press enter. And then we've got to make sure that maintain the dev temp FS system to mount a dev is, is checked. Well, it's been activated automatically, which is what this two minus is. There's no option in brackets, so it's automatically set. And then auto mount dev temp FS at dev after the kernel mounted the root FS. And you can see that's already um, set as well. We could unset that, but obviously it's recommending that we have that set. So we can just go out of here back to the top and move on to the next one. It says verify SCSI disk support has been activated. So um, unless you've got some sort of peculiar hardware, maybe you're on an embedded system, um, maybe like a mobile phone or something, um, you're going to probably want SCSI disk support almost certainly. So again, it's in device drivers, SCSI disk support, uh, device support, which is here. And once again, it's automatically selected, selected, it's been forced, activated, as you can see by the two minuses either side of the star. Then move on to file systems. So I go back to the top again, file systems, the next one down. It shows you recommended ones, so ext2, uh, you um, may want... 
Okay, no, don't want that one. So leave that one unchecked. Uh, ext3, ext4 is automatically forced on. Uh, this Rezor or Riser FS, um, I don't use that, so I'm not going to check it. And the others as well, JFS, FX, XFS, VTRFS, I'm not using them, so I've not selected them. Uh, good one to have at the bottom, DOS, FAT, NT file systems. You almost certainly want to activate these if you're going to read any sort of uh, USB stick. It's going to have some sort of FAT file system on it. It's likely to have FAT. Um, and you can see there it's uh, got default co-pages as well, which are worth setting as well. Uh, while we're here, just show you the CD-ROM file systems. If you've got CD-ROM in your machine, um, you probably want to activate these ones as well. Then we've got sudo file systems. So proc is already selected and tempfs are already selected. So they're kind of sane already. So next we've got PPPoE. So if you use that uh, for your networking, you, you need to check those. I don't use that, so I'll just check that I haven't got them installed. Network. There it is there, network device support. I can't even see it there, this is further down. Oh, there it is there, yeah, it's not set. Um, you may also want to set these options here. That's the bare minimum you need there for network support, and you probably want to activate your Ethernet drivers here. So you can see I've got my built-in 100 megabit card there, and I've got nothing else selected apart from the add-in card with the 2 gigabit network cards. So, um, and also if you wanted to just double check you are you have got the correct driver, you can do help. And this bit here after the config underscore is the name of the driver. And if you remember that's what appeared in the LSPCI, that was the um, E1000 that appeared there. So you can verify that you are selecting. And you can search by pressing forward slash. Uh, say if I wanted to search for E1000. There it is there. Note there's other ones with other information after it. So don't select that one because it's not the one that was reported in LSPCI. It's this one here and it tells you exactly where it is. And if you can't find that, it might need to be activated. And to find out how to activate that option, you need to um, examine this depends online. And it tells you that it depends on net devices being equal to yes, Ethernet equal to yes, and net vendor equal to yes. And if any of them are no, then you need to search for this uh, driver in the kernel and get it activated. So you've got to like, look around and find out what what depend other dependencies you need to activate to get the options to appear. So that's the networking. Um, if you've got SMP support, the next one, as I have, then it's just one option there under device driver, uh, sorry, processor type and features. So you can see I've got that activated. Do I need that one there? Yeah, it might be useful. Um, another one that's useful to have is the, yeah, the under processor type. If you go down to this option here, processor family, just make sure you've got the correct processor there so that the kernel gets compiled with the optimal um, instruction set for the processor that you're using. So as you can see for this AMD Athlon MP, that's the 32-bit one. If you've got the 64 bits, then you probably want that one there. Uh, next one we've got to look at is USB, so it's back to device drivers, HID support, which is down here. Um, bus support, generic HID driver is selected, yep. Uh, battery level reporting for HID drivers, yep, we've got that selected. Then under USB HID support, which is this one, it says to enable the USB HID transport layer, yes, yeah, so that's already activated as well. And then back one more, under USB support, 
make sure, well, you can see there for different versions of USB. For USB 1, it's OHCI. For USB 2, it's EHCI. And USB 3, it's XHCI. So you can see I've got USB 3. I've left it unchecked. I've got EHCI activated. I've also got the uh, OHCI. And because I've got um, a VIA card in there for the... Um, add-on USB ports, I've activated the UHCI. Um, yeah, so the next one, if you're doing like me, a pure 32-bit build, uh, you won't need to worry about this. This uh, emulation is for if you're building uh, a 64-bit uh, machine and you want to do multi-lib so if you want to support 32-bit and 64-bit computing you need to um, ensure that that option's set so for me that option won't appear at all because this kernel's been set up as a 32-bit you can tell it has been because the 64-bit option's not been set um, if you've got GPT partitioning you need to ensure that these options are set again I'm not using that, so if I look at that, um, uh, that little block layer, where is that? That's there. And then partition types, advanced partition selectors is not even set, so um, there's no point in looking any further. And you can see the EFI was there again. Um, I'm not using that, but under processor types and features, it may not even be there actually because I'm on 32 bit. Oh no, it's one time service support. Yeah, it is there, so I could set it in theory. Um, but you can see it's not set because I'm not using it, so that's fine. And that's it. Other than that, the thing to go through, the key thing to go through is to just go through all this hardware stuff and ensure that your hardware has been set, in particular the, the hardware for the disks is important. If you don't get this right, your, your kernel will never boot properly and you'll get an, an error, something along the lines of saying it can't find a um, suitable device. So I've act activated the ACPI support. Uh, there's the silicon image card that I had to activate that I had trouble with. Um, I thought it was underneath this um, where is it? Um, somewhere here. Oh yes, that's right. This SATA small form factor controllers with B, uh, bus mastering DMA. I thought it was this one here. If, I, if you look at this, this one's just called SATA SIL. But this one, the one that actually worked, is called SATA SIL 24. And if you recall from my LSPCI, that is the exactly the same as the driver it suggested. Um, well, it showed that it had been activated. So, like I say, it's important to get this right. Um, and I've activated this option for the parallel ATA because the CD-ROM is connected via an IDE card. So, once that's all done, just exit. Yes, I do want to save the configuration. And then we can go ahead and start building. So I'm going to time this. Like I said, I think the actual build with two jobs to run on both um, processors takes about half an hour or so. So we'll get that running and come back when it's done.
Okay, so that has finished compiling, so it took 45 minutes in total. Um, next thing I'm going to do, um, it may produce an error, is to um, build the modules. Now, as I say, I've not built modules into this kernel, so um, it will probably fail. Yeah, it's it's come up with an error saying that there's no module support. So the next thing is to install the kernel into boot partition. Now, let's check that I've mounted the boot partition, and yes, it's there. Oh, I've got to unmount this. I'm to unmount this floppy drive. So yeah, the boot's there. It's probably empty at the moment. Yes, it is. So if I do make install run this it copies a copy of the config um, a system map file with I think some symbols in there and then the actual kernel itself so you can see those files so that's the config that was used to create the kernel there's a symbols file and in actual fact this um, kernel is a little bit larger than I said it was probably because I've um, compiled in the Nouveau drivers originally when I was testing I hadn't put the Nouveau drivers in and it was about two or three megabytes so that's obviously increased the size of the uh, kernel by quite an amount bear in mind that's the complete kernel there's no modules there's no uh, superfluous well as far as I know there's no superfluous stuff I've built in um, so it is a lot smaller than had I gone with the automated version um, now I shouldn't need an init an, an RAMFS because I've built everything in I've got all the drivers that I need so um, if you do find you need that for whatever reason, there are some reasons you may need that. Um, instructions are there. That's how to use the sort of semi-automatic gen kernel and the distribution kernels. So the next thing to do is to do this emerge depth clean and this will identify any um, packages that are redundant, i.e. they've been installed and now been made orphaned due to stuff that we've removed unlikely to be anything there but it's always to either add the p command for pretend or i like to put an a command in because it gives you the option to actually go ahead with the depth clean or to abandon the depth clean rather than with a pretend you have to rerun the command there is just a warning with that though with the a if you accidentally press the enter button for whatever reason it will just go ahead and do the depth clean whereas the pretend will just run identify the commands and then exit. There's no, absolutely no chance of it doing anything until you actually use the depth clean command without the minus P or you do depth clean like I have with the A and I'll just answer yes. Um, sometimes, yeah, um, if I were to install certain packages, for example, it says as LFS as an example, it needs to have module support built into the kernel because the um, package builds kern uh, modules that um, are built against the kernel. So in that case, I'd need to enable module support. And after building ZFS, you need to run this command, module rebuild, to rebuild the any, any modules that have been built against the kernel that are not part of the kernel. There's a bit here about configuring the modules if you need to do that, if you've installed modules and also a bit about Linux firmware if you've got any hardware that needs firmware installing um, tends as I've found over the years not to be the needed so much with older hardware but certainly a lot of the more modern hardware um, they do need some sort of binary blobs to be inserted into the kernel or at least for the kernel to be notified that they need to be loaded at boot